my name is Heather Knight. I'm an electrical engineer and roboticist. And uh, last time I was here in Washington, D.C. was in December. And the month previous, I think there had been a White House science fair. And I was very happy to see this quote from Obama. Um, so tonight, here in Washington, D.C., you will get to see a cool robot demo as well. So uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I've been building robots and working with technology for the last nine years. I started out uh, at MIT. I uh, worked for the manufacturer of this robot, Aldebaran Robotics, in Paris. When I graduated, I uh, went back again to MIT to do my master's at the MIT Media Lab. They're really blue sky research technology, thinking about the future, which is perfect for an innovation summit like we have here today. I um, was at uh, JPL, uh, NASA Research Center out in California for a little while, um, and it was, it's basically on the edge of LA, so meanwhile, at my evenings, I started working with this uh, technology and arts collective, Synlabs, and so I'm gonna go sh show you a video of what you can make when a big pile of engineers and a uh, uh, rock band get together to make a music video. And right now, I'm working on my doctoral research uh, at Carnegie Mellon University at their Robotics Institute, one of the largest robotics research centers in the country, there's about 600 people associated with it, including all the visiting scientists and researchers. Um, and concurrently, I, I have a, a company that I run out of New York City. It's Robot Theater. It's a creative company, and it's called Marilyn Monrobot. You can see <laughs> the website up there. Um, if you're into the Twitter thing, Heather Knight. Right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of where we are with technology and robotics, um, and this, uh, this cool collaboration that I think can happen when you um, bring uh, different disciplines together um, to create new innovative technologies and, and uh, our My Little Robot, who is our disruptive future. Um, you'll notice the common thread. I, I'm really interested in technology that has the capacity to interface with us in everyday life, um, and that uh, involves sociability, so that'll be a theme. So, right, um, so I don't know if you guys have noticed, but robots are everywhere right now. Um, the reason why you might not have noticed is because they tend to be in places where humans aren't, like maybe doing research at the bottom of the ocean, we have a couple of rovers out on uh, Mars, uh, doing dangerous things, even dealing with some of these nuclear uh, catastrophes, going in places like that. Um, they manufacture much of our merchandise, handle, help harvest a lot of our food, um, but one of the biggest barriers between uh, those kinds of robots and the robots of science fiction, like Rosie, is uh, this uh, capacity to interface with people. If you have this robot going down a hallway and barreling through the doorway in front of grandmother, that's not very nice. Um, and so basically, uh, there's a, the technology is a bit autistic at the moment, and so, but if you give it the capacity and the uh, background and the intelligence, a general intelligence to interface with people, there's lots of new possibilities that um, open up. Um, they're, they're physically existing, so they can actually help people in, re in real life move physical objects, uh, actively reorient, uh, for example, a sensor network to get you a better wireless signal. Um, or, uh, and also in terms of engagement, uh, there's a lot of really interesting research in robots in autism um, right now, um, kids that might relate better to technology at first than to people, and so it's a nice stepping stone to full out social behavior. So there's a lot of, and there's also different ways that we learn with embodied technology versus on-screen technology. Um, and so th I have a friend that started a company, Intuitive Automa, that has this uh, little robot character um, that, uh, that actually helps you keep with your fitness and dieting plans by leveraging this sort of social cues. If you do something with a friend, it's easier to stick with. So another thing that when you have a physical uh, technology, you can, you can also sort of capture people's imagination in a diff different way. And so you'll see a lot of intersections of art and uh, robotics um, in this presentation. So here's a first uh, little project um, from, I think, 2005. Um, so this is an installation work um, that we did uh, at MIT Mobility Lab in collaboration with Pity Imagine um, in Florence. And uh, so what's interesting about this, if you think about kind of what this metaphor is, is so that you have this uh, thing, structure that we call the cloud that's covered in fiber optics. It has uh, uh, capacitive sensing if you actually touch the piece. Um, there's why, uh, there's uh, cameras, so as you walk by it, it can track some of your actions. And so you can create uh, engaging technology by leveraging some of those capacities. 
I was the only girl in the group, which was, is why I missed the video. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think I'll just skip ahead because that's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, right, so, so, we, so we have these robots, te te robotic technology that's getting increasingly advanced and opening up new applications, particularly as we add social intelligence. Um, another uh, element of where we are today is this idea of computers being everywhere. Um, I don't know how we would survive without our phones and without a lot of these capacities to store data um, or <laughs> even to remember what your next appointment is. Um, so in a lot of the way, we have already integrated with technology. Um, what we're going to increasingly see and what we have been increasingly seeing is this uh, intelligence in, in all of our physical devices. Imagine a coffee cup that could remind you, okay, hey, I think it's time for you to fill me up again. Um, <laughs> you, you're looking a little bit tired. Um, <laughs> so I think, or, or you know, like a, in the same way that the, the, like the, uh, we have the iPad stuff, like people have been talking forever about sort of flexible paper and different types of interfaces um, that could know what you're interested in and, and like source content from there or move from one interface to another. And so a lot of integration um, between intelligent objects. So uh, again, this also means that we can have uh, social intelligence in objects. And going back to uh, one of my first robotics projects ever, um, this is a cyber flora exhibit. And there's a bit of audio as well. So uh, I, I was working for this professor, Cynthia Brazil, at the MIT Media Lab. And she was invited to do an installation at the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Museum back in 2003 because of one of the newest rising design interfaces could be this idea of having technology that is social, not just social networks for us, but technology that can communicate with us the way that we communicate with each other. And so this is supposed to be a representation of, of how uh, you could create a really simple behavior system that is engaging and, and, and somewhat charismatic. There's a lot of uh, very simple uh, sensors that are responding to people. There's the idea of, of the techn a technology that can be curious as people are walking by, it might pan and, and uh, watch them as it gets close, perhaps it gets shy and pulls away. So you have this uh, concept for a very simple behavior system that we can relate to naturally. And, and if you can relate naturally to something, that's when you can start teaching uh, a machine to learn uh, by demonstration. And so you actually have the machine learn about being human so that you can act naturally and it can learn itself. So I have this slide sticks sometimes. But this is actually a frame of the flower that I designed, which is the, this, these copper flowers. Um, and uh, it was fun. This is a fun project for me because I started out as a mechanical engineer, and this was my first uh, project where I got to build things. But after I was the lead sort of repair person for this exhibit, um, so I kept going back and forth to New York City to fix like a when because it was in installed for six months. So occasionally there'd be a wire that ran out. So I got to um, be able to watch people interact with the exhibit quite a lot, and and. Uh, which is always really good when you're designing social technology is um, engaging with people. So third attribute, so we got robots, we've got computers, and um, now we have this idea of the cloud, bottomless data, the limitation perhaps in the future is, is and, and actually starting to be right now, is more how fast can you transmit data, not what your local memory actually is. And so what does that mean? Uh, there's some really exciting applications in the world of robotics for this. Um, a few, how many of you guys have heard of the, the Google autonomous cars, self-driving cars? Kind of got a lot of big media splash, right? It's pretty, pretty. It's kind of an interesting idea. To try to reduce the number of accidents by, you know, you still have the person in the car, but um, if you're just sitting over the Golden Gate Bridge and you're just like in, you know, uh, bottleneck traffic, then it can deal with like the two foot, two foot, two foot while you're checking your email. Um, but if it's a more serious condition, you still are there uh, in that loop. Um, also, you have uh, various telepresence platforms for robotics where now you can uh, go through and actually be part of a me meeting and not just uh, participate in the official part, but the, also the, you know, just outside of the meeting room conversation or drop by someone's office to say hello. And it's really interesting to hear some of the initial reports since this is a relatively new technology, only really getting popular in the last year, although it's been around for maybe four. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, where people will actually go and find the robot instead of even if like the person's online, just because it's a more natural interface to communicate with people. And you're starting to be able to do new things when you actually have embodiment uh, that's in conjunction with your computer. So 
uh, again, when you have a huge amount of data, you can do learning. Uh, on, and so one of the things I'm really interested in is working with uh, doing studies with real people so that you can gather lots of information to be able to train uh, machines to communicate us like us. Um, if you have a lot of data, you can design gesture recognition. And that's what I did for my master's thesis, which is this robotic teddy bear system that I, I, I used with real people and to see how they would relate to a machine that could talk to them and what, the chi what a child or adult, would ex how they would expect them to respond. Um, it has a, a fairly a simple mapping. There's uh, kind of sensors. There's onboard electronics. You can gather a lot f um, for the gesture stuff uh, off on a separate computer and then sort of train it. And then once you have the, the recognition there, then you can just put it onto the local electronics on the bear. And, and again, you have that like local computation that can relate to us on, in a more natural human way, which is kind of interesting. Um, the applications they had originally thought of for this was um, to have this robot in a hospital, the kind of bridging the gap between the nurse and a child. So you have this idea as of a tri tri triad where you're having a person, adult, and a robot working together for, with a third person to enable them to do something that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So, I mean, I, I always picture this, this free roving robot at cocktail parties that tells you the interesting people that you would want to talk to. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, Technology through art. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is a source of all true art and all science. So the unknown, the mysterious, is where art and science meet. So a newer idea um, that I've, I've been playing with um, is this idea that people that are in the performing arts are the charisma specialists of human society. They uh, know how to create artificial personalities. They know how to create artificial emotion. Um, and as, as good as uh, engineers stereotypically are at social interaction, uh, <laughs> perhaps collaborations with, with, with performers could inform the design of, of robotic systems. Um, if, for example, if you, there's a lot of acting theorists that have actually codified the meaning of particular uh, bodies of gesture. And so is, is it possible to translate some of what performers know um, into something that a machine would know. Uh, relating back to the kind of overarching idea, sometimes the most efficient path isn't the path that's going to have the most impact for your uh, customers or for people in general. So uh, this is uh, the machine I was telling you about when you bring a rock band together with a big pile of, of engineers. And something I think that's really interesting about this machine is the Rube Goldberg machine. So one thing causes another thing, domino effect. Um, but I think as this goes on, this passive action is going to be something that you sympathize with. That's the iPod starting the music. The speaker just kicked off that first ball. All of this is real. It took hundreds of trials to get the final shot. So there's one guy with a camera strapped around his waist for this whole shot, and he is an absolute athlete. You can sort of see him in the ball if you look closely. Notice the other 
TVs in the background? Awesome, right? Um, and I think this is relevant to robotics. Um, I think one of the reasons why that's such an interesting uh, video, in addition to kind of the intelligence of the band themselves and, how, and their you know, intuition of what, what would work and our awesomeness and knowing how to build it, <laughs> is, is that you, it's, it's an underdog. It it's, could fail at any point and usually did. Um, so it has this vulnerability. And, and I think it's a lot like sports. I mean, it's, the game's always more exciting when there's an underdog that comes from below and managed to still, to still score and succeed. We also know exactly what it's doing. We have this there's this transparency in its intention. Um, and like I said, the, with the performers, it always helps to, helps to have a great coach. So people can teach robots. Um, in addition to specialists, just anyone can teach robots because we're all social actors. Um, and so I, I'm a big advocate for bringing robots into the wild. Uh, a demonstration that I created last fall was this uh, robot stand-up comic system uh, for TED Women, which was the last event I was at here in DC. Um, and I gave a good portion of the audience these red-green feedback cards. So it would tell a joke, you, it would track your audio response, your laughter, your applause, and also you would have this kind of explicit feedback mode. And so it could change up its jo the jokes that it was telling based on your response, and maybe learn about what's funny or what you in particular find funny uh, from your re responses and reactions. So that's a loop that I'm really interested in creating, is how do you create live, real-time interaction systems with people? Failure is important. Um, they, they can help you learn. Um, and uh, it's always a great idea to track some of the data about those failures. Uh, I love this graphic of the robot physically putting himself back together. He's like, that leg was a little bit too long. Let's, let's shorten it up. But yeah, so this is... Uh, you know, a chart of basically how the, the audiovisual feedback could be used to change the robot's internal model of his audience and try to choose jokes that would make you happier. If you're kindergartners, that's going to be a different set of jokes than if you're a group of people at a bar. Um, so final uh, topic for this section is this idea, as I turn the robot on, um, takes him a minute, that storytelling can influence Technology development. Uh, a lot of engineers and programmers and uh, people of all sorts are inspired by heroes in television, uh, Minority Report to the mapping to the Connect or Oblong, this other company that kind of wants to replace uh, mo a mouse by gestural interfaces. So uh, storytelling can really inspire the creation of technology and influence the direction that we take it. Uh, if you look to science fiction, we have Asimov's Laws from iRobot, these, these the ideas like, so when people talk about the ethics of robots, usually that's one of the first things that comes up. If you contrast Western and Eastern culture, uh, in, in Western culture you hear more about Terminators technology going wrong. In Eastern culture you hear uh, it's more of a Shinto Buddhist tradition, you, the, like this, there's this idea that technology will inherently want to be in harmony with society, so you get robot heroes that are like, uh, that teach us how to be even more human than we otherwise could be, like Astro Boy, who's their version of Superman. Um, yeah, so culture and mythology can be a really uh, big influence. Uh, this can be a whole talk in itself and has been. Um, it's interesting contrasting the Prometheus to the Frankenstein to um, Astro Boy to Terminator. And uh, because I find all of that kind of stuff really exciting, um, I created a robot film festival um, this summer in New York City. Uh, some of the speakers have already had the pleasure of getting an awesome robot film festival sticker. Um, but it's July 16th and 17th. We're opening with a Spike Jones uh, film short, I'm Here. 
It's a robot love story. It's awesome. We have about 55 independently created films uh, that were submitted at this past weekend. So if you want to come up into our hood, it's awesome. And right. So uh, after the plug, right. So what does this all mean? What happens when you bring all of this stuff together? Where are these disruptive <laughs> futures? Well timed, robot. So we've talked about this idea of embodiment, of artificial social intelligence, of shared autonomy, of the robot being able to do things, people being able to share in that ability. Uh, this idea of human and robot teams partnering together at what robots might be good at versus what Let's we're good smell. at. All right, already. <laughs> Charismatic behavior systems. This idea of using interdisciplinary investigations to create new technology. Um, this idea of bringing robots in the wild with real people, like you guys. Um, and this idea of robots learning. So um, how many of you guys like stand-up comedy? <laughs> Woo. So maybe the brick wall will be familiar. Um, I'll let the robot take it from here. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? All right. Yep. Yep. The volume is good. Yep. Okay, thanks. Let's do this. Well, take a good look. They call me Data the Robot. Gosh, I love saying that. It makes me feel like some kind of superhero. But actually, I am just a mediocre robotic comedian. I was just in the United Kingdom last week. Remember, the guys who fought the Revolutionary War against? Right, well, the Red Coats were teaching me about some author, or was it a movie director? Anyway, they said his name was Shakespeare. Have any of you heard of Shakespeare? Okay, I see two or three people saying yes. <laughs> My perception capabilities are still in development, so I apologize if I am overestimating your name recognition. <laughs> right, well, perhaps this will sound familiar. It is an excerpt from The Merchant of Venice, though I took slight poetic license. I am a robot. Yes, a robot. Hath not a robot video cameras to see affectations, passions, or at least can he not be programmed to simulate these things? Are we not fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> but if you prick us in our battery pack, do we not bleed our alkaline fluid? <laughs> if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, which I admit we are not, we will resemble you in that. I would like to say it is a pleasure to be here, but, despite what you just saw, I am a robot and know no emotion. Heather, how about you get working on that emotion program? I am. Fair enough. My programmer designs my presentations with the goal of driving innovation in social robotics, which is the integration of robot helpers into everyday life. So you might as well get used to this. Right, guys? Social intelligence is so complex that many humans are not good at it. Any computer scientists in the house? I rest my case. Do not feel bad. My interaction capabilities are worse than yours. Using your feedback, however, my programmer hopes that one day I will be an autonomous, robotic, performer. Like Justin Bieber? <laughs> or perhaps Charlie Sheen is a better choice? 
That's what is called a tag line in comedy. One day, I might be able to choose my own tags just by searching the internet. According to my feedback data, you are a wonderful crowd, and I am really glad you are here for me. Because I want to tell you one last story, and I'm not sure if you know it. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, The galaxy is living in dark times again. The dark forces are back. But a knight is coming to save the galaxy. Accompanied by his faithful friend, now Pewdiepie. That's a robot doing the robot. They fought the enemy with bravery. Finally, there goes the, the enemy feeling. was defeated, and peace settled again. Thank you. <laughs> it has truly been my pleasure, Google Innovation, for the nation. Goodbye. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs> Awesome. So, um, quick closing. In the future, I believe that technology will bring us together in physical space, and we might even enjoy hanging out with robots at cocktail parties. Thank you very much. <laughs>